So uh, here we go. So uh, here we are, John part three, lesson number three. Y'all can still hear me, right? Oh, Kimberly, don't tell me 76 degrees with 8% humidity. I don't think I've ever experienced that before in my life. <clears throat> oh, man. <clears throat> so can everybody hear me okay? Oh, yeah, I bet the fires are bad. <clears throat> I guess it's sort of dumb for me to ask if you can hear me expecting you to respond. Do -do -do -do. Oh, okay, there we go. Great. <clears throat> Looking at what uh, Lynn's troubles are here. <coughs> Whoa. <laughs> yeah, you want to get that stuff addressed. There's no doubt. Oh, well, let me pray for us real quick, okay? We'll jump in. <clears throat> so, Father, I, I thank you for, uh, uh, Lord, sometimes we just don't do this enough. I just thank you for the life you've given us, for where you have placed us for such a time as this and where we are, <clears throat> whether it be on the backside of Red Bay or Colorado or Michigan or New Zealand or uh, Missouri or wherever it may be. <clears throat> Lord, we give you thanks for that. And I thank you, Lord, uh, for the opportunity of spending time in your word. Uh, Lord, forgive us for how we come across sometimes as if it's a, a burden is something that we have to get to and we have to do uh, rather than the joy that it is. <clears throat> and so uh, I thank you for the time you've given us this week. And uh, particularly, Lord, for this little, uh, what can I, how can we say it, guys, here, a little side trail right here that we examined this week. <clears throat> and so, Father, as we continue to just look at the scripture and pull things together, um, Lord, you teach us. And I pray, Lord, that these things that we have seen and what we're going to see, <clears throat> that they will be planted deep within our spirit. And then, Lord, when you desire to use it, that you will bring it forth and that you will speak it forth. And uh, thank you, Lord, and just bless you. And, oh, and Lord, also, for those who are unable to be here with us this evening, Lord, just protect them and just watch over them. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. So uh, what did we do this week in our lesson? What did we examine? Mm, yeah, basically, <clears throat> prophecy. Prophecy about what? Uh, about Jesus? What about Jesus? <clears throat> Yeah, who he is, what he uh, what he does, uh, when he was going to come. Uh, uh, let's see, uh, being raised from the dead, all those kind of stuff. Yeah, and you saw in your homework this week, and the precept people sort of lock into the uh, the number that there's 333 prophecies in the Old Testament of the Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, you know I sort of I understand you know where they get that number. How they count it. Uh, there's other ones. I think I, I sent a link to y'all to a chart. Didn't they say 351? Something like that. But actually, you want to go, well, who's counting? And a lot of times, you know, do you divide this one into one prophecy into two prophecies? That kind of stuff. Uh, hey, Kimmy. <clears throat> it really doesn't matter. <clears throat> the bottom line is that there were a lot of prophecies of the Lord in the Old Testament. <clears throat> and there's some that were fulfilled with his coming the first time. Some will be fulfilled when he comes again the second time. Some sort of had a dual applications and <clears throat> that kind of thing. And so <clears throat> we made absolutely no attempt to uh, try to go through all 333, <clears throat> which would have been really uh, tedious uh, to say the least. <clears throat> but what was the whole point and purpose <clears throat> of looking at this, of looking at these prophecies, just touching upon the major ones. Do I think they picked the best ones to pull out? Okay, well, that probably answers my question. Best ones related to what? You know, that uh, a lot of times you get questions where people are asking, well, what's the best about this? You know, <clears throat> I, I get these all the time. I get, what's the best keyboard to get? Like, you know, piano kind of keyboard. What are the best kind of computers? Sometimes people ask, well, what's the best kind of car? 
uh, what's the best Bible study curriculum? What's the best uh, vacation Bible school? Uh, the answer to all those questions is always twofold. Uh, the first thing is, what do you want to do with it? And the second thing is, how much money you got? <laughs> right? <clears throat> I mean, you can boil a lot of things down to that. You know, what's the purpose? So, <clears throat> so uh, uh, Carol says that the Jesus fulfillment of what was foretold in the Old Testament about him. <clears throat> and it was sort of an overview. Yeah, but that's it, Lynn. And the whole thing where they were bringing it from the lesson was that you would be able, and I find it interesting that Lynn put defend in those ghost air quotes right there. Is there any significance to that? Um, to where we would be able to defend who Jesus is to somebody who may ask a question. You know, how can you say that he's the one that is uh, Yeshua HaMashiach, that he's the one that's Messiah, that he's the one? Uh, why do you say that in uh, comparison to other people who've come along and said that? Oh, so Carol's going along and saying, well, I really don't think that these are the ones that help me defend. Why is that? Oh, that's great. And that's true. Yeah. We want to be able to give a defense for that which we believe. The scripture says that. Our problem is we usually are trying to gain ammunition and we come across as defensive. God doesn't need me defending him. You're absolutely right. Yeah, but apologetics is what you're talking about. Sure. Yeah, and apologetics is wonderful. <clears throat> so uh, what about that Zechariah? And one example is Zechariah 11 reference that made it look like it comes from Jeremiah. <clears throat> so Carol's saying she doesn't think that these were the best ones that help defend that Jesus is Messiah. <clears throat> uh, what was it about the uh, Zechariah 11? Is it just because it sounded like it came from Jeremiah rather from the Lord? <coughs> oh, I got you. Yeah, I got you, Liam. Uh, yeah, I, I, I know what you mean. It's uh, uh, the, the Jeremiah 11, you're talking about the 30 pieces of silver thing. Yeah, yeah. And that thing's actually sort of interesting because there's more Old Testament cross references to that. You find out that's the price of a slave, right? At 30 pieces of silver. I think they were sort of torn, um, is the way I sort of felt, <clears throat> torn between um, a cord slave. Yeah, yeah, a slave that had something happen to him. Um, torn between covering the basics, but then touching upon some things that people may not have known from the Old Testament, but trying to resist getting into too much detail about it because they didn't want to overwhelm people with work related to it. Uh, let me ask you this. How long did it take y'all to do the whole lesson? If you were able to do the whole lesson, how long did it take you? Uh, so Kimberly says maybe an hour. Yeah, an hour and a half. <clears throat> now, those of y'all, uh, Lynn, you're one of these that remember when Precept first started these things 40, 45, 45 years ago. They always said, you know, well, it's like an hour and a half a day. I mean, an hour a day. And uh, and they would get into some detail over some things. And that was fine. That was okay. And you did some things. <clears throat> uh, well, and that's it. You did spend an hour a day <clears throat> 20 years ago. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> I try not to use the phrase watered down uh, because that carries the idea that it is of... Uh, less value and you're trying to uh, rip somebody off and so if you've got a fine wine and you've watered it down <clears throat> yeah <clears throat> and i'm gonna mess with y'all so y'all keep on saying with the stuff right here <clears throat> um and when you say as in depth and not as deep i'm very very an anti-deep person because when i first started teaching these things back in uh well, it was 1988 so it's been heaven was that 30 years ago uh, everybody would always say, oh, those things, they're deep. You know, they're in such depth. And it was just like, there's something, there was some kind of connotation connected to this, that you're doing this, some kind of super duper Bible study that's unaccessible to anybody else. And, and that is beyond what just your average Christian is expected to do. Just all these things. <clears throat> you actually did dig in to the word more. And, and the precept people will totally, absolutely agree with you on that. Okay. As a matter of fact, uh, 
we are sort of in a little bit of a hiatus locally with our uh, precept class because of exactly that. I'd planned on doing Second Timothy next. We just finished Second Timothy. As a matter of fact, we've done First Corinthians and Second Corinthians, and y'all know the deal with what's going on with those churches there. And then we did Jude. Well, that was sort of, I think, God leading us because when you see all this stuff that was uh, in Jude and what's happening, well, I'm sitting in a Methodist church right now. Half my class is Methodist, other half are Baptist. And there's like a bunch of different churches. And I got some Episcopals and Lutherans here and there. <clears throat> but uh, I wanted to do First Timothy to, to sort of give them hope of how we're supposed to be as the body. So we did First Timothy, then I was going to do Second Timothy. Well, about three months ago, I get this email from Precept saying, hey, if you're going to do Second Timothy and you want to use the old book, then you need to get it now because we're we're releasing a new one, right? Well, I call up there and find out some things. Well, Second Timothy, the old way, is 13 lessons. Okay, that's fine. The new one is six lessons. That's a big revision. Well, and I found out sort of what it was. I sent some, you know, notes to people I know there. <coughs> and it's exactly what y'all are talking about. Uh, like in the second, uh, second Timothy, the old way, they spent an entire lesson on crowns. Well, here's what they found out, folks. And, and you know this from people you deal with, and we know it from ourselves. People just aren't going to give you 13 weeks on something. They're going to give you six and eight weeks. They'll give you six and eight weeks over and over and over and over. Okay, they'll give it to you like that. But if you come to them and say, hey, we're going to do Daniel, and it's going to be 19 weeks long which is what the original Daniel was, okay? Uh, they're just not going to do it. They came back and they split Daniel up, and it's, what, 10 and 9 weeks now, something like that. That's fine. Did the same thing with Genesis. Genesis used to be a two-parter. Now it's a five-parter, and it makes a lot more sense. The first two parts cover the first 11 chapters, and then the, the last three parts are character studies, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that type of thing, yeah, which is great. But they have eliminated some things. So let me back up and see what y'all are saying. And well, that's it, Carol. They want to be spoon fed. You have a hard time getting them to them. And Lynn, you're right. They emphasize the structure of the diagram, the passage, <clears throat> all that kind of thing. <laughs> Nowadays, you know, used to you had to go and you had to get the parsing guys. You had to get the concordance. You had to do all that. Okay, that's fine. I had my little doctoral Carol set up at home, you know, where I had all those books. But the harsh reality is this. I can click a button now. I can click a button on the computer screen right there and bring up more information than I'll ever remember. <clears throat> and it is a blessing and it is a godsend and it allows us to chase a lot of rabbits because the time that I would have been, you know, flipping through a uh, Strong's concordance, I can click the button now and see it. And so they are uh, abundantly aware of this and have been really struggling with, you know, how you do this uh, really the last 10, 15 years. <coughs> and so I think they're striking a pretty good balance between um, uh, giving a somewhat in-depth Bible study. Here's the sad thing. These are star far, far, far more in-depth than most people are getting in their churches anyway. And, and, and we know that. And so uh, a lot of times in the classes, we'll chase things a little further. We'll take more time. Like when we did Jude locally, I think that's a, is that a six-week lesson, I think, a six-week course. I think we spent eight or nine weeks doing it just because I wanted to spend some more time chasing the cross-references in the Old Testament and, and just doing it in class, and that's what we did. <clears throat> so anyway, yeah, you're right. It didn't take near as long to do the lesson. You did it like an hour's half time. Uh, they gave some examples of some things. Most of the examples that they gave were the ones that were directly quoted out of John. I think that's the reason they used them, right? Did you notice that? For the most part, they were showing, okay, this is coming from over here. And that's introducing people to the fact that, okay, here's what's being said up to this point in time. Here's what's being said in the 12th chapter. Here's what's being said and what happened with Jesus. <clears throat> and here's the prophecy <clears throat> that spoke that. Um, so anyway, are y'all still there with me? The last word I see is Lynn saying internet. Yeah. Okay, good, 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 good. Uh, there was one thing that I'm not sure if we did that in a lesson or not. Uh, up to this point in time in John, have, have there been anything uh, in the first 11, 12 chapters that did speak of things that came out of the Old Testament? Okay, I'll give you an example of what I'm thinking. I remember in the third chapter uh, when Jesus is talking with Nicodemus and he spoke of uh, as Moses lifted the serpent up in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Remember that? Were there any other things like that that were spoken of? 
Anything come to your mind? Okay, well, yeah, what's twelve forty? What's that about? Is, uh, Isaiah, Israel, yeah, and their unbelief. The Hosanna King is coming thing, yeah. <coughs> right, well. Blinded their, uh, what words is she trying to say there? Is that eyes? Or, I don't care. <laughs> I had some fun with that word right there. <laughs> yeah, how they were blinded. Yeah, anything else? <coughs> Excuse me, guys. I'm sitting here nursing <coughs> some ice water and some coffee. That's a great combination, isn't it? Uh, two separate drinks. <clears throat> You actually had several things that appeared in the first chapter. It talked about Moses and the prophets. Okay. It talked about how they wrote of a uh, uh, lamb that was coming, of Messiah that was come. Uh, in the second chapter, uh, it's talking about Jesus and uh, turn the tables that he would have zeal for his house. Remember that? That's a quote. Then the third chapter, what we talked about. And the fifth chapter, it was mission, how the scriptures testified of him. Uh, the sixth chapter, the bread of heaven, was a reference back to... Uh, Old Testament. Uh, in the seventh chapter, Moses' law is uh, referenced again. Uh, the scripture, a uh, living water, that whole thing. Uh, the eighth chapter was uh, about Abraham the prophets, the testimony of two. And then what Lynn talked about in the twelfth chapter. So there's actually several places of what we've seen so far that uh, spoke of uh, uh, the Old Testament. But we were looking at the prophetic things. So just real quick, I just want to run through some of these things. Uh, what did you see at the very beginning? What did Luke 4 have to say in relationship to Isaiah 61? Everybody fall asleep. What was that question again? <clears throat> yeah, I just asked what did Luke 4 say in relationship to Isaiah 61. It's actually the first thing you did on whatever day that homework was. That day two, day one or day two homework, where you sort of looked at the overview of the gospel. Yeah, Jesus told him that the scripture had to be fulfilled. Remember, Jesus goes back to Nazareth and he was handed the scroll of Isaiah 61. And he reads a, a certain portion of it. <clears throat> and then he says that this is today this has been fulfilled in your presence. It wasn't all fulfilled. And the part where it wasn't fulfilled, he stopped. He stopped in the middle of the sentence. You go read Isaiah 61. He stopped in the middle of the sentence. And he stopped at the point <clears throat> where he was going, uh, what he was going to fulfill when he came the first time. The rest of it is to be fulfilled later. Uh, what did you learn from uh, Luke 18? And you actually saw this cross reference a couple of what in a couple of places. <clears throat> See what was it, Luke eighteen thirty one? Yeah, they, they were going up to Jerusalem, and it was a fulfilled pro prophecy. <clears throat> And Jesus told him that everything that the scripture had said about the Son of Man would be what? It would be accomplished. He, that's actually said several different places in scripture in several different ways. And uh, did they understand that? No, they didn't understand it. Uh, you see that a lot in John, as a matter of fact, that the disciples did not understand until after Jesus was resurrected. But then looking back, they saw what he was saying. What about Matthew 26? And that was verses uh, 55 through 56. <coughs> and, and that's it. Uh, it. He was being arrested at this point in time, and it was to fulfill the scripture. Same way with uh, Luke 24. What did he say in Luke 24? That's a great passage right there, by the way. What, what's going on in Luke 24? Uh, 
Yeah, why were they slow of heart? <clears throat> yeah, because this is where Jesus is talking, and he, and he began with Moses, uh, which means he began with the first five books. Now, <clears throat> I don't want to chase this rabbit right now, but you will run into this. People said, people said, uh, we'll say, oh, well, Moses wrote all five of the first books of the Bible. Uh, <clears throat> no, more than likely he didn't. And there's nothing that requires that Moses wrote all that. We just sort of superimpose that upon him. The reason it's called about Moses is because it, it was about his life and it was about the law that the Lord gave him, okay? So when it says beginning with Moses, it just means the Pentateuch, the first five books. Beginning with that, he did what? Yeah, he explained about himself. And not only with Moses, but with what else? Well, he actually says that later, doesn't he, Kim? Kimberly? When he's looking at the uh, some of the Pharisees or Sadducees, and he says, you know, you search the scripture because you say in them you find life, but they talk about me. Okay? But it's not just the uh, uh, Moses. is Moses. is the rest of the laws. the prophets. It's the Psalms. The Psalms have tremendous amount. And we spent some time this week in a, one of them in particular, but there's actually a couple of them that say a lot. But what's really cool about this passage is right here, he says that, and then he opened their minds to understand the word. He opened their minds to understand the Bible. Uh, does the Lord open our minds to understand the Bible today? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And, yeah, Kimberly, I know what you're talking about right there when you say, uh, if they looked, they would find him. <clears throat> but they had to look how? Uh, and in Jesus' day, you have it. Today, you have it. There's people that know the Bible better than any of us will ever know but they do not believe it <clears throat> and if you don't believe it all you're doing is you're just trying to store up ammunition for something okay it, with a heart open to the flow of the spirit exactly that's what it is so uh with all that being laid out literally as the groundwork <clears throat> for what we were looking at uh let's go to that little chart that y'all developed in, in your homework right there because that's a pretty useful little thing overall just to sort of check the old testament and New Testament scriptures and the prophecies that were there. And again, I think that a lot of the reasons they use these things was to touch upon uh, the things that we would be covering in, uh, in the Gospels particularly. What did we learn from Micah 5? What was prophesied there? <coughs> uh, what about Bethlehem? Yeah, where he would come from, where, where this one, this Messiah would be born. Was it just Bethlehem? Was that just the name of it? Everybody's going, huh? What are you talking about? Remember, I think Micah was the one that said Bethlehem Ephrathah. And the reason that... <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, guys. The reason it was sort of um, precise right there is because there's a couple of Bethlehems. Okay? And it was being very precise as to which one. And yeah, that, that this uh, one from uh, a clan of Judah would come up from there. And of course, all these fulfillments that we see and all these things were predominantly by Jesus. Not all of them, because, uh, for instance, we get over when they divided his garments, it was the soldiers that did that, right? Yeah, that was very interesting, that his going forth was from the days of eternity. Why did you find that interesting, man? That's exactly what it is. We think of days of eternity of being from the point in time where we are right now, forward, forward, <clears throat> But when you see the concept, you see the principle in Scripture, the foundations of the earth, etc., this kind of stuff. The days of eternity stretch both directions. So as eternity has no end from our perspective right now, it really has no beginning And looking back. And so from the, his going forth was from the days of eternity. It was determined before the foundations of the earth that the Lord would do this. At what point in time was this determined? Oh, from the days of eternity. That's about all we can narrow it down to. But it is. That is a a, a very, very useful observation right there. 
And so we saw that that's uh, the fulfillment in Luke. And, you know, remember what uh, we saw in uh, John chapter uh, 8, that when Jesus said that before Abraham was born, I am. Remember that? And of course, they went crazy on him and sought to stone him, and he just passed away from him because it wasn't his time yet. So what do we learn from uh, Hosea chapter 11? Verse 1. <clears throat> and these right here really are the foundational kind of things that you can share with people that have legitimate questions. I don't think you use these, this type of understanding to try to convince somebody to be saved. But if someone is being drawn and they ask questions and they're totally legitimate in their questions, how can you know that Jesus is really the one? This is the information you, know, you need to know. <clears throat> yeah, call my son out of Egypt. So how can he be called out of Egypt and yet born <clears throat> in Bethlehem? How'd that go down? What'd you learn in Matthew? And as somebody said earlier, this is really, for us, not only an overview, sort of a review, review right? <clears throat> an angel told who? Or someone being drawn to a different religion. You're absolutely right, Lynn, yeah. Yeah, Joseph. Joseph had four very distinct dreams, uh, dreams, dreams of warning, dreams of instructions, dreams of commandment. And every one of them, you see him doing what the Lord told him to do. Uh, Joseph is quite a study of that. Yeah. And so uh, he had a dream, go to Egypt. He was in Egypt, had a dream, told him to come out of Egypt. And when he did, his son came out of Egypt. <clears throat> what about Zechariah 9? 9. What did that prophesy? Oh, and by the way, Micah 5 and Hosea 11. Micah 5 was about 700 years before the Lord was born. Hosea 11 is about 750 years before. You know, we had the hardest time conceiving that. I love doing this with people. Uh, where you are right now, okay, just where you're sitting right now, what was the state of that place 700 years ago? What year would that have been? Hmm, 1318. Lynn, I wonder what was going on in Red Bay, Alabama in 1318. Probably about what's going on right now. I love Red Bay. I drove through it once. <clears throat> yeah, it would have been probably uh, fairly sparsely populated as far as humans. Uh, so what, what do we see in Zechariah 9? <clears throat> uh, oh, somebody, yeah. That's the thing, the foal of a donkey, that it was prophesied that a king would come on the foal of a donkey, <clears throat> which is an interesting thing because you see in John, uh, which we're going to see more, how he comes. Uh, the Indians would have been roaming where Kimberly is. So, yeah. Yeah. But it was prophesied. And, you know, when, when Jesus came in, they were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They called him the king of Israel. And Jesus didn't deny that he was the king. He knew that he was fulfilling. And, and you see that in John 12. Uh, what about Zechariah 11, which we talked a little bit earlier about? Uh, the 30 pieces of silver. If the fold donkey gets really interesting. Um uh, I actually did, a, you know, y'all know I do a little daily podcast kind of thing. And um, I just happened to be in the podcast sort of where we are uh, uh, lesson-wise in this course. I hadn't really planned it that way. We just sort of wound up that way. And um, so I spent a little time chasing this around with the cross-references. And Matthew tells us that there was a coat and there was a, 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 a burrow, a donkey, okay? That there was actually two animals, Okay. The other Gospels just mention one. John just says that, uh, uh, and, and Jesus found the donkey. Doesn't really go into detail how the, uh, the Synoptic Gospels do. You know, where the Lord told him, okay, go into town. You'll see a donkey over there and, and go get it. If anybody asks who it, you know, why you're taking it, just say that the uh, the Master needs it, the Messiah needs it. <clears throat> he goes in all the details in Matthew, Mark, and Luke and that. But Matthew actually tells us there were two animals, which is sort of interesting. I'm not quite sure why. But anyway, you see here uh, the, the 30 pieces of silver and what happened. And when we uh, encounter the Judas story, you see that that's exactly what happened. Uh, Judas felt remorse. And boy, Judas is such a case study. Because uh, you find out you can feel remorse without being repentant. Okay, And he felt bad about what he did. And he tried to give the money back, but the, the chief priest wouldn't take the money back. So Judas threw it down on the temple floor. He thought, well, I'll just throw it back at him. That'll take care of that. 
they didn't want to mess with it, so they went out and bought the potter's field, and that literally fulfilled the prophecy that Jeremiah had given. <coughs> yeah, you can be sorry for being for caught. Um, you can feel bad about what you do and not really repent. Uh, Judas is quite a uh, a warning for everybody all the way around. You can't you can't nail down the conclusion to every little element you want to with Judas. I mean, there's just so many things there. I think that's the reason that the Lord said it'd been better if you'd never been born. You know that that's a sad conclusion uh, to anything. So Zechariah 13, what'd you find there? What was that prophecy about? Yeah, you strike the shepherd so the sheep would be scattered. And this is one, I mean, you know, you're pulling a verse out from this really, Zechariah 12, 13, and 14. My, if you haven't read those lately, read those before you go to bed tonight. <laughs> Uh, related to the, the great day of the Lord and all that will happen. And what you see here is there's parts of the things that are, are related to Jesus coming the first time, <clears throat> other parts related to his uh, second coming and what's going to happen with him. And um, I mean, just tons and tons of things. But the thing that was emphasized right here was that the shepherd would be struck and the sheep would be scattered. And that's what you saw fulfilled <clears throat> in Matthew. Uh, what about Isaiah 53? What's it about? <clears throat> Excuse me. I do pretty good if I don't talk a lot. Maybe it's just God telling me I'm talking too much. What do you think? <clears throat> yeah, this particular thing, that when Jesus was afflicted, he didn't speak. <clears throat> Particularly when he was afflicted by uh, <clears throat> the religious folks, okay? By the religious one. He was afflicted. He was oppressed. <clears throat> uh, false witnesses, but he didn't open his mouth. Uh, when he was questioned, you know, by uh, the secular powers, he says, well, it's, it is as you said, okay? <clears throat> but you see it being fulfilled in Matthew 26 and in Luke uh, 22, uh, literally that he poured out himself <clears throat> unto death. And he wound up being crucified uh, between two criminals. And it's sort of a, uh, I've been thinking about this. This came up yesterday in a Sunday school class that, that we had. And uh, just sort of a sidebar kind of thought that Jesus being crucified, there was a syncretism that was happening here with <clears throat> the Romans who were killing two criminals, <coughs> you know, because of what they had done. And then the Jews wanting to expedite things and get rid of this problem person right here and kill him, but do it in a way that they can get him dead and get him off the cross before the next day. Because the next day was a holy convocation, was a Sabbath day. And that even the Romans wanted to get this done because the soldiers wanted to break their legs where they can get them off the cross, and get them killed and go home for supper. <coughs> um, of how the state was working uh, with the religionists to expedite this. <clears throat> and uh, I think there's probably some serious foreshadowing and words of warning for us in that. Does that make sense? Uh, anyway, just some things. Also, remember that that Sabbath that they were trying to get Jesus off the cross, that was not the weekly Sabbath. Y'all know that. Okay, It was the Sabbath of the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which was going to begin at sundown. <clears throat> so, uh, Probably the most powerful prophetic psalm like we know now. And Kimberly's going, don't go down that anymore. I've heard that enough. Ah. Uh, psalm 22. Uh, okay. Psalm 22 is probably the big, most profound prophetic psalm, particularly related to Jesus' crucifixion. So what do we learn from that? Beginning with verse 1.
What did you see there? Psalm 22, 1. <clears throat> and I think this is sort of a picture for us to learn from, too. This is that, uh, uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yeah. So why is that important? Because you saw in uh, Matthew, that's what Jesus said, right? That's what he cried out on the cross. And what you see the Lord saying in his most intense, challenging time, what was he saying? He's speaking forth the word. <clears throat> okay. And I think that's maybe something good for us to realize right here. Maybe we need to be taking this thing in even more aggressively <clears throat> to where when times get more and more difficult. <clears throat> that our response will be what? The word of the Lord. Now he's saying this, yes, <clears throat> um, as a uh, uh, fulfilling prophecy. There's no doubt, okay? And somebody just said, well, uh, yeah, the, the things about dividing the garments and all that, yeah, it's absolutely true. But I think he modeled it for us. <clears throat> what did you see in verses 6 through 8 of the 22nd Psalm? <clears throat> the psalmist is describing himself as a what? Uh, like a, a worm, not a man. A reproach, despised, sneered at. Yeah, people <clears throat> wagging their heads at. It's totally descriptive of what the people were doing with Jesus when he's on the cross. Oh, yeah, he did all this great stuff, let him get himself off the cross now, right? And you see there uh, in the fulfillment of it <clears throat> in uh, Matthew that the uh, uh, the chief priests and the scribes, uh, the leadership, the elders, they were mocking him. You know, let, let God rescue him now. It's literally fulfillment. And they were blinded to that. Why were they blind? They knew the scripture. Yeah, can you imagine church leaders? Church leaders mocking. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no doubt. Even the things that Jesus said that we're going to see later on in John, <clears throat> when it said that I'm thirsty, we see that kind of stuff prophesied in the 22nd Psalm. You saw it in the 14th and 15th verse. <clears throat> no doubt. No doubt. We're not to put any faith in a person. <laughs> okay? I think we're to walk in humility before one another. We're to love one another. We're to exhort. We're to encourage. But to put faith in. Okay? I might trust you. I might do this. I might do that. You know, whatever. Oh, yeah. I know. I know. It's just a... Uh, Sort of heartbreaking. I don't know. Well, uh, and in the 22nd Psalm, you actually see uh, a picture of what happens when you're crucified. You all saw the elements. Your tongue sticks to your mouth. Your bones are out of joint. Your heart melted. There's no strength. Why not being buried when you die? And it sort of makes you wonder what the, uh, 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 David was going through when he wrote this. You know? And did he know... I don't think he knew that he was writing a description of uh, Messiah to come. But something was going on in his life. And whatever that was, and, and you know, sometimes I think this is a great thing for us to understand. You know, do you ever think this way? Let's say there's something horrific happening in your life. Um, I'll use me and Lynn. Uh, Lynn, you and I have both experienced things in our lives with our kids, Right. Things that we, we would not have chosen and things that we did not like and things we know. <clears throat> but sometimes I just had to keep reminding myself, Lord, I don't know what it is that you've got planned for us personally, what you've got planned for them, <clears throat> that you are allowing this. I'm not saying God's requiring these poor decisions that they were making because <clears throat> that's what was happening in our kids. I, I, as shocking as it may be to y'all, mine and Lynn's kids have made a poor decision every now and then. Why is that? I can tell you from my perspective because they're my kids, <laughs> right? I mean, we've all made poor decisions. We've all done things. But God, what is it that that you have got planned for them down the road that, that you're going to allow them to walk through this? And so David was going through a horrible thing, and he received this word right here, and he wrote it down. And it was prophesying Messiah. Well, okay, there you go. Taught you what prayer is during that time. I bet you thought you knew what it was before, right? 
you're taught prayer and you're taught perseverance. Um, you're taught that just because they're your kids, when they're three years old, you can make it right. When they're 33 years old, I can't make it right for you. You know what I can do. I can love you. I can intercede for you. I can speak the truth to you repeatedly. <coughs> it really is. Yeah, it really is, Lynn. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Boy. Yeah. And so the same thing here. So David, whatever's going on, whatever's happening, he writes this down. He's describing what's going on in his life, and it's literally describing what Jesus was going to go through. Uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, I don't remember who it was that said, I think it was Carol. Uh, this psalm talked about how the garments would be divided. Okay, the soldiers, uh, you know, they cast lots for things, but they didn't want to split the tunic because it was one piece thing. Totally fulfilled in scripture. And then uh, you, you chase one more Psalm. Uh, was it Psalm 34, yeah. Psalm 34, what'd you learn from that? <coughs> yeah, that no bones would be broken. <clears throat> and uh, again, why would they break the bones? Just to expedite the death. Because uh, in crucifixion, uh, you would keep trying to press down your legs to lift up your lungs where you could breathe one last breath. And when your bones broken, you couldn't do that. Oh, that's funny. Uh, yeah, Jennifer's daughter, uh, Lynn's daughter, she's a drama queen, and David was a drama king. What's your husband's name, Lynn? Uh. <clears throat> uh. <laughs> David, <clears throat> yeah. He's, he's Mr. Laidback computer genius guy. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. <clears throat> Too much engineer. <clears throat> then, last couple of scriptures here. Uh, Zechariah 12, what did we learn from that? <clears throat> you know, I just thought of something. I wonder if that's why they call drama mean drama mean. There's too much drama in your stomach because you're getting seasick and that kind of stuff. Huh. Yeah, the one who they pierced, they're, they're going to weep bitterly. Yeah, and the reason is because he's going to pour out upon them. Uh, what was the cross reference to John 19 related to that? <clears throat> they look upon the one whom they pierced. Has that been fulfilled yet? Yeah, not in total. Uh, and I, I would say um, not at all. Uh, the Jews as a nation, what, what you see in Romans chapter 9, 10, 11. That type of thing, okay? And then uh, Psalm 16, what did you learn from that? And again, I'll, I think the, the main reason they picked and chose these passages to um, support that Jesus was Messiah. And you can, you can find this kind of stuff on the internet. Uh, and, uh, the chance of one person... Fulfilling five of these things is one in so many thousand, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> and the chance of anybody fulfilling all of them is just nearly <clears throat> nothing, you know. Yeah, what you find out that is that he's going to be resurrected, that his uh, body would not decay. That's the whole point, that his body would not decay. <clears throat> and um, you saw this in the 118th Psalm, First Peter, I mean, 16th Psalm, and in John 20, again, that he would not let his Holy One uh, undergo decay. And then uh, the last psalm you looked at, 16, 118, mm -hmm. First Peter, uh, that the resurrection fulfills all this. And that they rejected the cornerstone. Uh, what, what does a cornerstone do? That's what you see in Psalm 118, which is sort of interesting because, uh, you know, when, it, <clears throat> when they had the Passover meal, part of what they did uh, was that they would sing a hymn together and the thing that they sang uh, was a group of psalms, and Psalm 18 was one of them. It's the support of the foundation, absolutely. What else does a cornerstone do? It, that's what it is. It's like a marker. <clears throat> it gives square. It gives sense of direction to that which is being built. <clears throat> okay? <clears throat> which, you know, this way, that way, 
right, left, north, south, east, west, whatever it may be. <clears throat> but it gives the sense of duration and it gives the square and marks the foundation. <clears throat> so uh, you saw that they rejected him. <clears throat> the name of the building, yeah. Okay. He was rejected, but he was raised up. <clears throat> uh, wh what did Peter have to say about that cornerstone? You know, uh, the Lord used Peter to be pretty descriptive, to be a good old uh, business owner. Yeah, that he's the choice zone, uh, a stone of Zion, that the Lord laid in Zion, a choice on. He's a precious cornerstone. <clears throat> and so it's the Lord this is. And if you believe in that, uh, and boy, there's so many things you could chase around. You believe in this stone right here, you won't be crushed by the stone that you see over in Daniel, right? So the last passage you looked at this week is out of 1 Corinthians. <clears throat> Chapter 15, the great passage on the resurrection. And what did you learn there, uh, particularly verses 3 through 4? Yeah, those that reject was the stone, the stumble, the stone that crushes them. Yeah. So 1 Corinthians 15 said what? Did you notice a repeated phrase? Yeah, he died for our sin, according to the scripture. He was buried, which is proof that he actually died, right? And he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. Okay? And then he appeared to many. <clears throat> and, and it literally proved, but according to the scripture. What scriptures is being referenced here? Uh, I think that's, you're right. What scripture is he talking about? And Paul wrote 1 Corinthians. Uh, at this point in time, he, he would have been talking about the Old Testament. Absolutely. And that's the, the prophecies. You know, we looked at just a few of them. He would have been talking about the Old Testament. And people go, well, oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> well, you know, sort of where I live, it's not that uncommon at all to hear people say um, that there's no need to study the Old Testament because we're a New Covenant, New Testament church. So there's no need to study it. There's no need to know it. And yet it is those scriptures that declare the Lord. Okay, that declare the Lord. And uh, churches that don't say that forthrightly like like that will act like that. Uh, sometimes the fact that they just sort of ignore the Old Testament, or if they do give some teaching from the Old Testament, like I've got a friend right now that's um, uh, you know, teaching a series <clears throat> through the Old Testament. And uh, <coughs> you talk about a flyover. This is not from 30,000 feet over. This is from um, 250 miles over, like a satellite flyover of the Old Testament. They just don't really get into it that much. And I understand because, uh, you know, it's hard to do that from a Sunday morning teaching, preaching pulpit perspective. And though I did have a pastor when I was in college that did preach through the book of Exodus. And he did it uh, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. And uh, it took him about a year and a half. And at first I thought that was crazy. Uh, but the more we got into it, I saw, oh, I see that. Uh, why is that? Why not tell John Piper what? Well, I don't know. I'm seeing what point Kimberly's making here. <laughs> oh, yeah. Years to go through Romans verse by verse. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think uh, I think you can start anywhere in the scripture and go everywhere in the scripture okay and uh, i remember i told my son-in-law aaron and some of y'all have met him through these classes through the years and uh you know they started the new church uh i don't remember when it was i think it's gonna be like maybe three years this coming fall something like that and god's just blessed them they probably got like 250 people that are involved in it now <clears throat> and uh, he was gonna because uh, we were talking about how they were gonna do it and 
I sort of just told them what we did and we did that kind of thing down in South Florida in the nineties. Um, we just started preaching and teaching through acts and spiritual gifts. And he says, you know, I think I'll do the series on acts to start with. And he laid it out. He thought he was going to do it over about uh, four months or um, uh, six months, something like that. I said, well, the problem with acts is if you actually do it right and you teach through it and you have a counter here with Paul, and then all of a sudden you realize, wait a minute, this is when he wrote this letter. So maybe we need to go see what he wrote to the church at Corinth or what he wrote to the church at Ephesus. So he's actually been doing some of that. And uh, he's I think he's at the 21st chapter of Acts right now. And he's been preaching it nearly three years. <coughs> he took a time and a season to go to go through First Corinthians and then came back. And, and I think you could do that. I think you can start with Genesis and do it. I think you can start with Romans and teach the entire Bible. OK. Um, and, you know, guess what? However, the Lord leads us. Uh, we just need to take our time and say, Lord, what is it you're wanting to say right here? Uh, Romans, oh yeah, you can spend years uh, going through that, no doubt. Uh, anyway, uh, oh, wow, time's up anyway. Uh, anything else y'all want to share? <clears throat> well, let me pray for us. Lord, I thank you for uh, just a few of these scriptures, uh, literally the hundreds that you fulfilled the first time. And Lord, I thank you for just the awareness and the warning that in the same way that you prepare and you fulfilled all these things uh, the first time, that you're going to fulfill all of them when you return again. So Lord, just, may we just know those words. Uh, oh, Lord, I do pray for Jackson Way then. And uh, just ask that you will provide for them <clears throat> who you have next. And Lord, I pray the same for a local church here in Northbrook, whose new pastor just started this last Sunday. And so Lord, we just trust you in these things and thank you in Jesus name. Amen. Amen.